Uh, welcome to Horasis India, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, on behalf of Ravi Valur, he extends because of technical issues, he can't be on board. But I, my name is Kanisan, I'll be moderating the session. Um, I want to thank uh, quickly to Dr. Frank and Jürgen Richter and the organizers for inviting all of us to be on the uh, to be on this session mm-hmm. and um, on India and Southeast Asia. So you know we are all facing the COVID pandemic and uh, uh, the economic crisis uh, that has that has hit all all the nations, uh, primarily uh, throughout the world. And uh, we just want to talk about how we're going to deal with it. And of course, uh, in, 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 in light of the geopolitical, worsening geopolitical situation, um, it, it, it seems to be there is uh, big efforts going towards um, decoupling the efforts uh, done by U.S. So India itself is currently caught in a very tense situation with, with China. So we can, coupled with all this in the scenario, we are in a multifaceted challenges. But many people will also see that as uh, uh, opportunities. So we have 45 minutes on this session. I will get straight off. I'm not going to do, do introduction to the gentleman here uh, because, you know, your profiles are all there. So we get straight off the bat with uh, Brad. Um, you know, Vietnam has got uh, couple, uh, one of the better track records of the handling of the COVID. And um, what's this post-COVID future looking like? And um, what gains are you seeing in terms of FDI flows and manufacturing relocation due to this uh, uh, huge uh, changes in the um, um, the logistics issues? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, for that introduction. Um, uh, I, of course, I've been uh, I, I went to the states in uh, January, toward the end of January. And uh, when I went, it was really interesting because uh, even in January, Vietnam was quite aware that this corona, COVID-19, they didn't call it COVID-19 at that time, <laughs> but they did call it a coronavirus that was beginning to uh, take hold in China. And uh uh, but yet they didn't really, uh, they didn't stop travel or anything, but they were quite aware. Uh, and a lot of in Vietnamese were wearing masks and they were telling me to wear masks and I was kind of talking that down. I said, it's an overreaction, uh, you know, I, you, you're, and, uh, and then I go to the U.S. And it also, there was not, there was an awareness that it was a problem, but nobody was preparing for it. Although people in Vietnam was asking me to buy masks, N95 masks, and I couldn't get them in the U.S. They were already sold out, even in places like Walmart and Costco. And so, uh, but nobody was wearing masks, but they were starting to hoard them. Uh, I couldn't get too many masks back to Vietnam. Well, at any rate, I get back to Vietnam in early February, and then uh, that was right after the Tet holiday. They had closed the schools. They were already taking lots of measures to slow down, uh, you know, uh, interactions with people, uh, eventually uh, uh, flights from China. But all through January and February, um, Vietnam has a, a borders with China. Uh, they have millions of Chinese visiting, uh, both the business and uh, tourists, uh, lots of interactions. Uh, so if any country was possibly susceptible to the Wuhan originated the virus, Vietnam would be. Uh, and what's amazing is that um, little, almost nothing happened. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the schools were closed down. They were social distancing. Uh, you had to use, wash your hands all the time. You had to wear masks. Uh, I kind of thought it was a bit of an overreaction, but I've been proven really wrong on that. Uh, but uh, Vietnam was pretty, pretty much locked down through uh, March and April. Uh, now, you know, the result is uh, uh, almost no infections. I think they had uh, 300 and some odd infections, and over 300 people are fully healed. Uh, they did quarantine maybe as much as 100,000 people. 
they were very aggressive at identifying, and anybody tested positive, they rounded up every contact they may have had. And those people were then put into isolation or quarantine. And, uh, yeah, very much similar to um, a Malaysian experience as well. Is that right? Yeah. So or how are they handling? Okay, they've done it well. What? But um, economically, you know, um, are they are they seeing? Have they responded? And what have they done to respond fast? Then? Um, well, what's interesting is that uh, manufacturing um, has dropped a little bit, but they're still at about seventy percent capacity, which is pretty good. The tourism sector, of course, is devastating. Uh, if, uh, there are no foreigners coming into the country now. Is the country that has 20 million foreign uh, tourists, and now now it's zero. So the tourism and travel uh, industry is really getting hit hard. They're trying to make up for it with domestic uh, tourism, uh, but but every, everyone says that the GDP will be less. But they're looking at a five percent growth rate for the year. Still very incredible, yeah. That's quite incredible. I I think they're quite optimistic about that. We know there's been quite a few supply chain disruptions, uh, uh, but in general, everybody sees Vietnam as maybe somebody might come out of COVID-19 uh, better off than most. Uh, we think there's a big demand for investment. Of course, Korea, Japan, and China is looking at uh, Vietnam. Vietnam is still a big producer of food uh, that they export. Uh, uh, that's a, a mainstay for the economy. So I think that Vietnam is, it may be one of the winners. And I think they, they, they deservedly should be applauded for the way they've handled this uh, pandemic. I think they're going to be very conservative about opening up. Uh, that might slow the economy a little bit. Uh, but uh, I think they're a, they're a model case for how it should be done. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, they kind of make my country, the United States, look uh, like a sick dog in comparison to the way the U.S. has managed this. Uh, that's good to hear, Brad, in times like this. Good to hear some positive news coming out of Vietnam. Uh, uh, welcome on board. Aditya, is that you? Can you hear us? Uh, I think you can't hear us. Okay, let me quickly get on to IJ. IJ, uh, uh, electronics is particularly interesting area. And India is in the cusp of major changes in, in terms of uh, made in India. Uh, could you uh, talk about the current context in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the COVID impact towards your manufacturing? What are the positives that are may come out of it? Did you hear me? Okay. I think yeah, I lost uh, Thank you, Kanesh. Um, my my. We can hear you. Are you able to hear me? You can hear me now, yes. right? Maybe my network is unstable. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And thanks for that, Brad. It's really good to hear the positive news coming out of Vietnam. I think we need some of it here in terms of managing the situation. Uh, we have, uh, we did have probably the world's, probably the toughest lockdown. But, uh, you know, we had that for a good almost, what was it, about 45, 50, 60 days almost. Uh, we are slowly coming out of it and uh, we are coming out of it. The reasons why we went into lockdown have not gone away. The numbers are increasing by the day. We are trying the social distancing. I must say the government is doing the best they can. But uh, there's, of course, a lot that you can do when you are dealing with 1.3 billion people and trying to keep them in check. So we just hope that we are able to um, minimize the impact on people's lives here. Uh, I think and that's what the government has done really well so far. Uh, if you see the percentage of, uh, you know, the percentage of people who have actually fallen prey to it versus the number of infections. Um, but we still have a long way to go before we can be where, you know, countries like Vietnam and Malaysia are at this point in time. But coming to your question on uh, the, the manufacturing, let me just roll back a bit and talk a little bit about the manufacturing that has happened in India over the last four to five years, specifically in the mobile devices industry. So the Make in India program was actually kick-started in uh, September 2014 um, with much uh, fanfare and so on. And I think one of the industries that actually was the torchbearer for Make in India in India was the mobile devices industry. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you why. 
So we started off by having a phased manufacturing program uh, between the industry and the government, where we actually uh, got a tax holiday on certain components, on the import of certain components, so that you know we could be competitive in terms of price, uh, as well as start to ramp up the manufacturing really fast. So the finished good duties were kept pretty high, but the component duties were kept low, so that we could start building the ecosystem in India and start manufacturing uh, manufacturing here. So what happened in the last five years is the electronic industry actually doubled and the mobile devices industry from a manufacturing standpoint actually went up six times. Uh, and while we manufactured close to 50, 55 million devices in 2014, we closed 2019 with 330 million devices that we manufactured uh, in India. In 2014, we had about two manufacturing setups for mobile devices. In 2019, we closed with 268 of them. In India and exports went from zero to about three and a half to four billion dollars in 2019. Having said that, uh, really uh, the gross value add that happened in India was not to the extent that you know it should have been. So a lot of what happened, what a lot of what happened in India was around assembly. We used to assemble. We became an assembly unit for mobile devices. So we were importing all the components, the chipset, the displays, the batteries, and everything. And what what our factories here became were assembly houses for them. And as a result, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So as a result, you know, we didn't get the kind of value added value add we needed. Mm -hmm. And we were, you know, manufacturing as a percentage of GDP remained at about 15% where it was six years ago. Now going forward, there is this national policy on electronics, which was uh, laid out in 2019 to make India a global hub for electronic system design and manufacturing across the world. And that's where a lot of focus has gone in. Uh, there is an ambition of uh, making India a global hub for mobile devices specifically. And I think what COVID-19 has done is that has kind of accelerated this process. Okay. Uh, and of course, sorry. No. Yeah. So, so one, like I said, COVID-19 has driven companies to follow the China plus one strategy when it comes to manufacturing and uh, supply chain. Added to that is the India is India's low per capita income and the skilled labor that we have here in India. We have the demographic dividend of uh, having a much younger uh, consuming base and a much younger uh, labor force. We have a large uh, consuming population here. Uh, as it is from before, so it is really attractive for uh, uh, for companies to come and set up set up here in India. And then with the onset of 5G, we have close to 450 million users of feature basic phones who are waiting to move over to smartphones. So we already have a base of about 400 uh, smartphone users, 400 million plus. Mm -hmm. We have another 400 and 450 million feature phone users mm -hmm. waiting to move over. So. All this, and with the coming of COVID-19, with this remote working, with the importance of the smartphone, with people wanting, you know, the, uh, the use of smartphones has gone up by almost two hours per day uh, for people in India. The uh, data consumption is, uh, is also gone up by 30%. So that's going to demand more and more smartphones, and that only accelerates the requirement to have uh, smartphones here in India. Right. Now, what the government has done... Sorry, go ahead. No. On the back of that, you have a strong, uh, uh, strong, strong growth on uh, on the mobile devices for 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 manufacturing. So I just want to leave that for a while there. Yeah. So you you you've got that going. You got the made in India uh, uh, impact, and the government is pushing on that. And I'll come back to you uh, to to expand on that a little bit. Yeah. I like to go go down to Krishna Kumar on, on the back of on the back of what uh, Ajay has said. You know, what are you advising? I mean, you run the consultancy about uh, for investors in India, and um, uh, what advice are you giving these uh, people these days in terms of investment, and, and particularly with the Indian uh, landscape? Yeah, so India has always been uh, a, a great destination for many foreign investors to look at new opportunities, and it has always been like that. So, but uh, I think the last three, four months, it's giving uh, uh, a stimulus uh, primarily because of the, the global uh, trust deficit, which now China is facing. Uh, I mean, this is, I call it this trust, uh, trust deficit. And how can this trust deficit benefit India? That's, that's what uh, Indian government is thinking about. Um, you know, smart entrepreneurs in India is thinking about this, right? How to bring in this uh, a very unique context. It's a very unique context right now. 
uh, which has not been there uh, before. We were talking about a broader economic uh, advantages so far. Now we have one more thing to say, like broader economic advantage plus the global trust deficit of China, which is like creating an emotion to the whole rationale, right? So, um, uh, so this rationale plus emotion has led to many American companies, many companies in uh, Japanese, uh, South Korean companies to try look at new opportunities. You know, um, uh, I mean, I don't know whether how practical it is to move manufacturing things from China, but now the thinking is on, right? The thinking is on now. Uh, so especially when you when you when you, um, uh, you know, when things like this happen. So for example, uh, you know, Tokyo I mean Japan uh, actually 2.2 billion USD has been given as a stimulus package to help companies to move out of China. So this is like um, you know telling the entrepreneurs to seek out new opportunities or think beyond China. So. Uh, it needn't be India alone. It can be like uh, Vietnam or you know other um, happening uh, emerging countries in the you know, Southeast Asian region. So, um, but these kind of things really don't happen with uh, trust deficit. But mostly, uh, ultimately, the business decisions are based on um, many other real factors, right? So, uh, even though they emotionally get engaged with the whole thing and then try to uh, leave China for for some matter. The real reasoning will come uh, in economics, like how uh, how is going to happen, right? Whether we have the right infrastructure, whether we have the right kind of connectivity, whether we have the right kind of talent available in India to do such things. So, for the, the reason why, uh, almost like in last three months, thousand two hundred applications came to uh, government of India for uh, from uh, different companies in China, like. Uh, uh, owned by uh, non-Chinese, like the Americans, the South Koreans, the Japanese, or you know, and the the, the, the indicate what does it indicate? It indicates the fact that there are so many companies who are now trying to look at India as a destination. Right. It can be manufacturing destination, but the the whole thing is about how prepared we are for right now. Maybe COVID nineteen is not the time to prepare for you know infrastructural uh, readiness for a large country like India, but at the same time. Uh, this is a time to uh, send a message to the world saying that, you know, India can be trusted so, and we, em we empathize and we have the culture of acceptance. So these are behavioral things which can really help at this point in time. So, I, I mean, uh, your, your, your word is Krishna. Uh, I mean, it's um, India is ready, willing and uh, time is right. Uh, time is good to invest in India right now. Into its, uh, Great. I mean, uh, we just lost uh, Aditya. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just want to share with you, even before COVID, um, the supply chain disruption, which primarily is uh, the number one, uh, uh, one of the key things that has happened out of the, the COVID-19. But the supply chain disruption started late last year already. You know, even in the, in the birth of Zan, there was a lot of concern with the US-China tension that they were going to face this supply chain disruption anyway. And India was the best place to, to take advantage of this. And my, my, I, having worked in India, and I've shared this with, uh, many times even with the government in India, is to get streamline all their policies. I mean, getting the GST right was a great, great step, but they need to do a bit more in terms of uh, streamlining the processes. But the Vietnam was one of the key benefactors of the supply chain disruption even before COVID. And I believe Vietnam will be even a bigger uh, benefactor from that. Malaysia, on the other hand, has now branched out and made ourselves a great uh, foray into medical. We are the largest, we produce 60% of the world's rubber gloves and later gloves and examination gloves. We are also doing a lot of uh, testing for medical equipment. So every country seems to have had their own niche. And I, and, I, and I would like to actually go back to Brad to see how India-Vietnam relationship can be expanded to, to maybe break through on this kind, of, uh, this kind of linkages for both the countries. India having the, the, the benefit of technological development and Vietnam as a manufacturing excellence. Uh, Brad? Yes. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, I've talked to quite a few people uh, in the last year or so where there's a lot of interest from various Indian uh, business businesses and investors, uh, and they're actually looking for Vietnam um, 
looking to buy companies, uh, looking to, uh, to get actively involved in this market. Uh, and, and there are a lot of different reasons. One is that Viet- Vietnam itself is uh, a fairly big market, uh, with nearly 100 million people <laughs> growing very rapidly. It's in a good neighborhood, you know, the, it's surrounded by growing countries, uh, relatively stable. Uh, and Vietnam's largest trading partner happens to be, guess who? China. So Vietnam is a backdoor to the China market. And, uh, and it's uh, China's largest trading partner. I think two-way trade between uh, China and Vietnam is, uh, is uh, close to $100 billion. Um, so it's not a small number. Uh, and it's growing. So I think a lot of people can see Vietnam as a platform for, uh, you know, selling more and more into Southeast Asia and uh, into China. And I think quite a few uh, Indian companies uh, see that. Indian companies are also, uh, they manage a pretty tight budget. They know how to operate in a country like Vietnam. Uh, and uh, so um, I, I'm seeing quite a bit, quite a bit of interest, actually. You know. Great. You know, yeah. That's good. I mean, I, I've met quite a number of uh, uh, Indian companies that are they have relocated, relocated out of India into Vietnam in yeah. that space. So, Ajay, coming back to you on the electronics and uh, the, your, your, your space, right? Uh, do you see that, that uh, with this kind of size of market that you talk about, and uh, do you see the uh, V-shape recovery into the uh, manufacturing and uh, maybe even the Indian economy? So, uh, of course, it's uh, difficult to predict because every day is a new day with COVID-19. But I do see more of a U-shaped recovery than a V-shaped recovery because uh, uh, it depends on the industry. If you look at industries like uh, tourism and aviation and uh, uh, entertainment, it will be a much longer haul. Uh, but other industries like retail, I believe, could be a V-shaped. That could The consumer retail business could start coming back. I do see e-commerce growing even more rapidly than it was in the past. Uh, I do see telecommunications uh, industry coming back really fast. I see our industry of smartphone devices coming uh, coming back fast, but the average selling price probably going down. So you will have consumers who will probably buy cheaper devices maybe, but they will buy devices because it's becoming that much more important in the COVID-19 scenario. And and this COVID-19, uh, it's, there's no such thing as post-COVID-19. It's now just COVID-19. We have to learn to live with it, right? So it's going to change our lifestyles in many ways. We are going to be working from home a lot more. We're going to have that, you know, that mix of office and working from home. So there is going to be, that's going to throw up a lot of opportunities. But if I answer your question straight, I do expect overall a U-shaped recovery. I do expect uh, India to come roaring back in 2021. But first they have to negotiate 2020. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I think, I still think that Aditya, Aditya, can you hear us at least? Or are you, on, are you logged in? Okay. We will wait for you, Aditya. Try your best. Uh, Krish, uh, Krishna, let me come back to you. Um, so where would you want, uh, if you're advising an investor right, in India, where would you want them to put money in terms of industry plus geographies? Geographically, situation, the north, the south, the east, the west, which you think would be a good place to... Uh, to invest, and what industries do you think that India uh, would be uh, would be a good place to invest in? Yeah, I, I would call it as more of like a window of opportunity at this point in time uh, than uh, sectoral investment advice, right? So, for example, um, uh, we look at uh, see business model is something which uh, they have to figure out, and here, you know, as a destination, as a country, uh, and the geographical you know structure we have, you know. When you say the economic geographical structure we have as an in India as a country, uh, it's it's very different from uh, the neighboring countries. It's very different from every other country. So, uh, the first thing which uh, we as um, when we talk to uh, you know companies who are like willing to come or have start conversations to understand how things work here, uh, I mean we need to tell them like uh, you know we, we can't be giving a, a prospectus to them like uh, it's such a huge country. So we have to give them. Um, you know, clear trust-based conversations like, hey, this is how things happen here. This is how inefficient some things are. This is how certain advantages are, right? This is how the growth is. And this is how 
structural inefficiencies we already have. So we cannot remove the structural inefficiencies and show a different India to them. We have to work in that structure, that inefficiency, that you know, sectoral problems, but still have a lot of opportunities, the growth opportunities to explore. So a very realistic at the same time uh, compared. So there is always, I mean, we cannot compare one thing with other without, um, you know, parameters, right? So for example, now we have uh, a trust problem here, you know, in certain countries. So India is a very open country in that matter. Uh, we have a pretty much stable government at, at this point in time. We have a very growth seeking government. Uh, like uh, Ajay said, we have a high growth, uh, you know, internet population growing at a very fast pace, uh, you know, very cost effective connectivity. Uh, and of course, connectedness to the other countries. Of, and of course, a large English speaking population. These All these things really make uh, India like a sweet spot. We call it as a sweet spot for people to explore, people to start conversations and and really explore so that's the sweet spot uh, one and the other one is the window of opportunity which we have right now like ajay said like one year we have uh, an opportunity to look at things um, compared to any other country in the world probably okay i, I just want to share a, a thought with y'all um, i was in the infrastructure space uh, uh, building an infrastructure pro- project in uh, mumbai and um, you know the the call of the day in the, the india over the last uh, maybe 10, 20 years have been infrastructure, build build the roads, build the highways, build the metros, you know. But let's take a pause here now. What has COVID-19 shown us? I mean, the pandemic has shown us. One, work from, working from home is equally productive. I, 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 I think equally, if not more productive. Second, yep. it has shown that, that, that you can work online and even the elderly and people who are uh, who are who are not uh, uh, tablet friendly or gadget friendly can get accustomed to get, get that. the smallest of the traders are getting onto the bandwagon of uh, trading online. Thirdly, we it has shown now today we have excess capacity. Now, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, let's take hotels. Now let's take hotels. Let's take um, uh, buildings, office, commercial buildings. They are all going to be excess capacity. You know, mm-hmm. anybody building it, they will know that this. Uh, so what my suggestion has been, governments should stop spending on infrastructure, re-look at the demand, look at the excesses in the space, and set up a national corporation to buy up these assets. Why? Because you need space for hospitals, you need space for government buildings, you need a space for schools. Look, the schools have to be virtual. So you have schools which are going up, but you have open fields that you have for extracurricular activities. So what had this, today you look at a building in in Malaysia, some of the offices that we are in, I mean, 20% or 30% are leaving. So many new buildings are coming up. That's impossible for them to get onto this. One more major excess capacity is cruise liners. (laughs) Convert them to ships. Of course, I mean, the returns may not be there, but convert them to be ships and they can go anywhere in the world, wherever there's a need. So uh, I just want, uh, I'd like to go around the table and talk about excess capacity and how can one use of it. Maybe, Brad, we can start with you. Um, well, uh, as it, very interesting. I think today, yes, there's a lot of excess capacity, uh, but uh, both in the commercial office and residential and, of course, hotels and but CBRE came out recently and said that's all going to be gone in six months in Vietnam. In fact, uh, they don't see they see prices temporarily coming down, but shooting back up. Um, maybe maybe it's a U, maybe it's a V-shaped uh, recovery. But in the real estate area, they feel there's not enough uh, capacity. Uh, I th- so I don't know. I mean, Vietnam needs everything. Vietnam needs infrastructure. Uh, my goodness, they still don't have a decent highway system. Uh, they need a lot of power. Uh, they need uh, airports. Uh, they they need uh, hospitals. So, Brent, in, in this context, how can the Indian companies uh, the Indian companies work with with, with you or you know, the 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 Vietnamese? In this? What are the space that they can really look at? Oh, I think uh, I think manufacturing. Uh, Vietnam is becoming really picking up a lot of business from uh, uh, China for sure. 
Uh, you've got big players in Vietnam now. Samsung has probably moved just about everything to Vietnam. Uh, all their smartphones and uh, as well as uh, as well as the white goods, you know. Uh, and then all the suppliers that cater to uh, Samsung. And then you have Intel and you've got uh, Microsoft. Uh, they're developing a, a real uh, high-tech uh, business in Vietnam. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost kind of across the board. Um, and I think that, I still think that uh, travel and tourism is going to be huge in Vietnam. It's, it's, the, uh, it's a very popular place. I mean, uh, uh, from, from Chinese to uh, Japanese, Koreans, you know, everybody likes Vietnam. So, uh, and if anything, they don't have enough capacity. So, so Vietnam is in a way lucky. You know. but, but healthcare is a, a real sore. You know, it, it is really behind the times. And I think Vietnam is so lucky they didn't have a, a big breakout of the COVID-19 because it would have been a total disaster in this country. People would have been dying on the streets because the hospitals couldn't have come close to taking care of uh, people. But, so health care is a big problem. Education is also a way back where there are lots of opportunities in education. Uh, Lots of e-commerce opportunities now. So you've got e-commerce, you've got education, you've got hospitals that the Indian corporates and Indian uh, Indian businesses can look at collaboration. Yes. Uh, yeah? Okay. Absolutely. Um, services too. Sorry? Financial yeah. services. Okay. All right. Ajay, maybe taking on from there, um, it looks like, you, uh, looks like Vietnam will be a competitor rather than... <laughs> Because you are trying to build, you know, you to build our phones, and, uh, and is that collaboration in terms of supply chain because of the geopolitical situation? Whether you see an opportunity for these uh, collaborations? Yeah, yeah, no, no, increasingly sure, uh, for sure. So while we are saying that there is an opportunity to drive the manufacturing in India, uh, just looking at the electronics or even any industry, it's impossible to really uh, develop products in isolation of other countries in the world. So there needs to be deep collaboration with um, with countries in the supply chain. There needs to be a global supply chain um, system to to deliver products. So even if we are manufacturing in any one place, you have to rely on other places uh, for the manufacturing. In fact, today, Vietnam is one of our biggest sources of supply for our devices for Nokia. Um, we have a big setup. Uh, we, we source from. We used to have a big setup there, but now we've outsourced it to one of our partners. So, in terms of the infrastructure, Kanes, I think in India, it's probably an area where we do need to invest. What kind of infrastructure is is important? Uh, maybe not office spaces. I agree with you. We probably, if you come to a Gurgaon or a Noida or some of these places, you will have overcapacity. Uh, residential uh, market has been in a slump for the last nine years. So, I mean, that market in any case, we have overcapacity. But when it comes to uh, building electronic uh, cities, manufacturing clusters, where we can attract investment to come and invest, uh, where it comes to building uh, state-of-the-art airports, while we have moved a long way in the last five years, there's still a lot of ground to cover. Roads that need to be uh, you know, laid out. Switching to 5G technology, we haven't even auctioned our 5G spectrum. Forget about testing the, the spectrum, you know. So there needs to be a lot of investment in infrastructure in India. And I think that continues to be the case and will continue through this decade. Question is, what is the infrastructure we invest in? Uh, and that is where we need to really take a hard look at what is going to make us competitive in the future rather than invest in places like office spaces or residential complexes, which there is overcapacity. Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, uh, Krishna, what about your your your? What are you seeing um, key interest in in, in, in investments right now? Uh, so I think the last five six years we have been seeing um, you know internet economy. I mean people moving to internet economy in a big way in India, and uh, the last I mean COVID nineteen has actually made that shift uh, you know possibly much more visible, uh, much more understandable to many people. Right. Uh, so this was like this transformation was already happening unknowingly, knowingly, these things were happening in our, in our daily lives and businesses. Uh, but this has made a very clear signal that, you know, this is an accelerator. Like you said, the working from home is now a reality. Remote learning is a reality. Digital transformation is like a thinking. Uh, people are rapidly thinking on how to move to the next level of uh, digital transformation to make businesses happen, con the business continuity plans. 
So I think India is at the right um, um, you know level, especially when it comes to the um, the internet connectivity, uh, the, in, the digital infrastructure. So even though we have problems in terms of the physical infrastructure, which is required to run a large country like this, uh, uh, the digital infrastructure is pretty much in place and it is very strong when it comes to doing digital businesses. The reason why many of the even Chinese uh, companies are investing, the investors are coming to India to invest in large internet companies because they're pretty sure that the uh, people with uh, internet connectivity, pretty decent connectivity, plus people with purchasing power, with people with uh, you know who are internet savvy, you know the large uh, segment which is almost almost 400 million people right now in India, which who can who can use phones, who can uh, use you know shift to internet economy much easier than we thought of. So uh, any internet based businesses. Uh, would find a sweet spot right now. I'm not saying that everyone will be successful, but at the same time, uh, uh, that's going to rapidly, you know, uh, happen, you know, in this in this time. Yeah. So, Brett, coming back to the space of uh, Indo-Vietnam, uh, I mean, Vietnam in India cooperation and collaboration. Uh, have you seen? Have you seen this? Uh, have you? Do you see anticipate any? Uh, tension in uh, vis-a-vis China. Uh, big China is one of the big, being the trading partner, big trading partner, and obviously the big issue in town today is the is the geopolitical tension. Has sure. that impact? Uh, maybe you'd like to add some things on that. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> well, uh, China. Uh, what do they in Vietnam? They say Vietnam was under Chinese rule for a thousand years and then fought China for a thousand years to remain somewhat independent of China. And so this is the fact of life. You know, Vietnamese have gotten accustomed to uh, dealing with, uh, you know, the big northern neighbor, you know, and uh, they're quite good at it, you know. But at the same time, Vietnam doesn't want to be pushed around by China. And therefore, Vietnam has moved in a very certain direction to have a very excellent relationship with the United States. And even though uh, the U.S. president is beating up on China and other countries on trade, he's leaving Vietnam alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and the relationship has never been this good. I mean, uh, even on a military, uh, scientific basis, trade basis, the relationship with the U.S. has never been better. And, and uh, at the same time, Vietnam says, well, of course, we have a special relationship with China. Just because... We're doing all these things with the U.S. doesn't mean that we are anti-China. But, in fact, the people in general are anti-China. Uh, and I think when they hear about a virus in China, their antenna goes up really fast. And they don't trust anything coming out of China. And so uh, it's an interesting uh, you know, relationship, cat and mouse uh, relationship they have. It's in their best interest to maintain uh, peace, you know, with and trade and good relations with China is, is their best interest. So India actually is in a similar situation, I think. Um, and I think that Vietnam would welcome to have uh, a strong relationship with India that goes beyond just trade. I think uh, even security and uh, uh, things of that nature, because uh, India has some issues, I think, with China as well. Uh, so. Uh, and then, of course, Vietnam needs friends to help them when China starts taking uh, territory in the South China Sea and other such places. And uh, so, um, and, you know, the TPP, Vietnam was very, very interested in the TPP. Yes, yeah, it's a big change, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of countries were interested in TPP. Yeah. Uh, not India, because they, they, were, they were not party to that and they were trying to get in. Uh, so... Now that these uh, trade agreements are all uh, adjourned, uh, so you see bilateral agreements. Uh, so being a big nation by itself, Vietnam is a big source of market for India as well. Yeah. So I think that that's something that you can see going forth and there are a couple of uh, opportunity to invest. Um, uh, uh, I think you were talking about 5G uh, in the space. Do you see that as an as a uh, added impetus for your industry in the coming coming few years? If the is for sure, for sure, <clears throat> because five G, what it does is it, uh, it takes the speed up almost fifty to sixty times where we are today. 
So the kind of, um, and I agree with uh, Krishna Kumar when he says that, you know, when uh, the, the uh, opportunity that it will throw up in terms of the businesses, the internet businesses, you know, there are 400 million odd people on smartphones today. And like I said, there are another 450 million who are on 2G phones, on hmm. feature phones. When they start moving over to uh, smartphones, just imagine the number of people that you have internet enabled. And once the latency goes down, which is the speed at which uh, the internet responds, which is what 5G will do to you, the kind of um, applications and the kind of enterprises that can that can blossom on the back of 5G are, is amazing. But unfortunately, I think India, we are a little behind on 5G. I think 4G has t taken up a lot of the, the resources that the uh, telecom companies had. So that's an area that we really need to focus. And I think COVID-19 is going to accelerate that as well. I see a lot of traction in that space as well. Just uh, another question. Uh, um, you know, what is the impact of 4G? What is the impact of 4G on SMEs in India? Has, uh, have they... Have Huge, huge. I think it has increased transparency, the whole uh, digital finance piece. You have companies that have Paytm, for example, which was a tiny company, now has 350 million active users on their on the platform. And that has happened purely on the back of 4G. Uh, you have uh, uh, Reliance Geo that has pushed the boundaries and created 380, 390 million subscribers to their 4G devices because 4G services, they only have 4G. So uh, I think the 4G has, you see the start of SMEs and start of businesses on 4G. I see them going to the next level with 5G because 5G is going to afford them massive opportunities. In the future. So it's quite a uh, level of playing field, yeah? Um, let me try and see whether Aditya can speak. Uh, we can't see you, Aditya. Can you hear us? Okay, maybe going over the uh, following up from from where uh, Ajay left us on the on the SME, so that we are we are, we are the, the levels of business SME uh, to the huge business and the intermediaries. So this uh, why is there opportunities for investors to come in into uh, uh, smaller industries? You know, normally when you talk about investment, you're looking at the large scale investments. Is India welcoming small and medium scale investments as well? Relocation of small and medium scale industries out of ASEAN, uh, which may have moved up the cost scale, or uh, which may need the technical capabilities, etc. Rish? Yeah. So uh, on moving um, uh, businesses from the rest of the Asian uh, you know, uh, countries um, in the region to India is a very uh, you know very tough game. The, for the reason being, I mean, it's a cultural exchange. It's a, it's a cultural thing which is happening. Uh, and we can work with the U.S. and the U.K. much uh, faster than probably we can work with, uh, you know, China or, you know, South Korea, right? So the reason is, um, uh, it's primarily, though we are in the, geographically we are closer, uh, culturally it's entirely different. So uh, small and medium enterprises, India itself has got a huge um, uh, set of entrepreneurs, enterprising people who understands the local context very well. And of course, uh, they are uh, you know, technology enabled, they have the infrastructure, they have access to almost everything, which is uh, which is right now in India. So I think investment must come on some medium sized to large sized firms where uh, they can bring in probably a technology which is not available in India or a new way of working, you know, say like uh, a management style, which can really you know, generate efficiency um, and and produce you know good results. So, a small medium enterprises is like a sweet spot for Indian entrepreneurs, and from medium to large, you know probably uh, the companies from outside can come. Yeah. Okay, we are down to 42, 42 minutes already. There's another three minutes to go. I just like to go around the table. Maybe Brad, you can start up with maybe giving uh, your 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 uh, your thoughts on the on the going forward COVID nineteen pro, uh, cross border businesses etc. Mm -hmm. Um, I, well, I think uh, I think Vietnam is going to uh, bounce back. Uh, however, however, Vietnam at the same time uh, is a big exporter to the U.S. and Europe and Japan, and China, of course. Uh, and we're we're not sure of how the demand side is going to work out. I, I think that's there's a lot of uncertainty as to, you know, what's going to happen. We have Samsung as a huge, huge investment in Vietnam, but everything is shipped out. And where is it going now? I don't know, you know. 
And so we're, we're all kind of hoping that, uh, that this pandemic will get under control, you know, and people will go be able to get back to work and grow the economy. On that note, uh, we have to say goodbye to the rest of the people. We keep staying on the line. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining the Horasis Asia co-developing Asian brand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just hold on. I, I want to do a photo. And I think they, they, uh, let's do that a virtual group photo. Start a group. And yeah. uh, we miss Aditya, uh, so we'll just do that. I think you all can do a, a selfie as well. Yeah. What do we do? We just click on it. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, if you go. Right, yeah, uh, I did mine. <laughs> the camera, right hand side, bottom, that on the third uh, box from the uh, the right, uh, there's uh, like a camera. You just click on that and smile, everyone. <laughs> it's a pleasure, pleasure having uh, 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 with all of you. And I hope we can, uh, I have a more uh, longer session. It seems to me the time flies uh, uh, very fast. Uh, I hope uh, this has been a good session for you all as much as it's been good for me. Mm -hmm. And please keep in touch in any way. And I think Ravi is online. Hey, Ravi, we missed you. Hope we can see you. <laughs> and Aditya as well. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Lovely session. Lovely meeting all of you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys. Good to see Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.